This would have been his normal week. Welcome to everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live as we gather to worship our Lord. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Revelation chapter 4. It's actually also the passage that the message will be from. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles there. If you want to use the seat or table Bible, it's page 1030. And uh, as we listen and read uh, these words of Scripture, uh, one of the purposes is to be just preparing our hearts for the Lord's table, for uh, coming back to Him and saying, I'm yours. Uh, is there anything between us? Uh, it says to examine ourselves before we take communion. So I invite you as we're reading these uh, words of Scripture to uh, just have that quiet invitation to Jesus to show you anything that he wants uh, you to confess before you participate in communion. John tells us in the revelation of John, after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, this was from chapter one, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne and on the side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and this amazing scene uh, that John reveals to us. May it function for us, Lord, as a way to open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, to unseen realities about your larger story, your presence, your involvement the significance of who you are and how we might want to relate to you given who you are. So I pray now as we uh, celebrate again the Lord's table, taking within ourselves a piece of bread which represents your body which was broken for us and a cup which represents your blood which was shed for us, reminding ourselves again that you have rescued us, that you have made possible our release from captivity to the evil one. Justice uh, received all that it was due so that we might, in faith, when we trust you, we might become your children. And then as we journey through our lives in this fallen world that is still under the influence of the evil one, that we can know what is true and that you are with us, that you're presence is always there, that we can cast our cares upon you because you care for us, that you desire and want and will be involved with us in regards to our maturing, our changing, our being transformed more and more over time. 
to look like you. And we pray that we would see what those things look like when they come up. We would agree with you about them and embrace the process of maturity that you enable and are pleased for us to be involved in. Thank you for loving us and inviting us into your family. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. As you feel ready, uh, take communion at one of the two stations. <coughs> Thank you, Nathan. Each week we take some time to pray for uh, requests that are present that we know of in our community. And if you have something you'd like us to be praying for, you can be praying for. You can think about that. And in a moment, I'll give you a chance to, to share it. Um, we have, uh, Jeannie just shared with me to ask you to be praying for her mom, Norma, who's having a, an AFib procedure Friday. This, she had one in 2018. She's a little bit of concern because of her Lewy body dementia and the effects of anesthesia. So they've told us that it's not general anesthesia, it's just sort of a twilight zone drug that they give them when they have this. So. Just be praying for Norma. Um, I know Lem Golden's mom had heart surgery last Tuesday and uh, had a couple valves, I think, um, either replaced or put in or something. So just be praying for uh, her recovery. Any other requests that we can be praying for? Yes, in the back, Jimmy. Okay, a di disorder of a teenage daughter of a friend of 
jimmies and emily i'm assuming <laughs> anybody else okay let's go to the lord in prayer lord um it's just so challenging how uh, the stories we can make up in our mind that are not true are not connected to reality and um, something like eating disorders is an obvious example of that where the the mental image of the person suffering from this is not aligned with reality they see themselves one way and so they they make major adjustments to their uh, eating to things that they're doing not doing uh, based on this false untrue picture so i just pray for this young gal that you would bring uh, into her life uh, a sense of uh, being able to be embracing reality and the picture of the way things really are and that you would bring healing to her body and to her mind at this time pray for her parents who i know any parent with uh, someone that they love is challenged in this way is just so uh, just feel like there's nothing you can do it's out of your control so i just pray they would be able to entrust themselves and their daughter to you and to seek from you um, a response to this Think of Norma, who's having this procedure on Friday that it would go well, and then the effects of whatever she gets to uh, get her through the procedure don't have negative impact on her on her uh, dementia. And uh, Lord, we just pray for she and Eugene as they journey through their later years that you would continue to enable Eugene to care for her and for her to live at home. Think of the believers uh, from the Ukraine who are now in other places, uh, sometimes within the country itself, but often in Poland or the Czech Republic or other surrounding countries. And some of the people even that have gone to those countries have been, they moved on from there to other countries in Europe. So I just pray for, for them, for those who are caring for them and providing for them, um, that you would uh, continue to provide for them, but that you would bring many to your name as a result of, of what is a very negative and difficult time for them, that you would bring goodness and hope uh, in the midst of this very difficult time. For our country, for our governing officials, we pray for them as you tell us we should, that we would live peaceable lives. And I just pray they would have a being gripped by the responsibility and by the fact that uh, they've been entrusted that by you, allowed to be in that role, and that they will give an account of themselves to you. Um, Lord, I just pray for um, any that are here uh, that have requests that didn't feel uh, the freedom or just it's something, uh, just a concern, of, a personal concern of theirs. I just pray for them at this time that they would have the sense that you know and that your spirit prays for us in words and in ways that we don't even know necessarily how to express. And we thank you for that, Lord. Think of our ministry partners, Hope House Detroit, Redeemed Children in partnership of Pastors International and the the way that we can participate with them, but also in the ministry that you are doing through them. And I pray that you would provide open doors and opportunities and impact through those ministries. Thank you for a couple of days of really nice weather. And uh, the signal it is that something is, something is changing. Uh, it's a signal of, of a, a changing season. Spring and, and summer are on the way. And we thank you for that. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. So uh, you have an opportunity, all of us do, to participate, to steward what God entrusts to us financially uh, through giving. And he can uh, guide us and prompt us as to what that would look like for us in regards to doing it through Hope Community Church. And there's some stuff on the screen that uh, talks about how uh, you guys can be doing it. If you're online, obviously the... Uh, online hope .org, and the link or the mail is the way to go 
And uh, just want to let you know about some upcoming activities. Uh, we have a women's group that meets at 9.30 this week. Note this if you come at 9.30 on Tuesdays at the Coffee House, which is at the top of the hill, kind of 500 Main Street, a new coffee house or remodeled, just opened again recently. Uh, 500 South Main Street, they're meeting there at 9.30 and they're going to have breakfast. So note that. And there's a couple men's groups that meet on Thursday morning, 6 and 7.30, and uh, one that meets on Wednesdays, the second and fourth Wednesdays monthly, which includes this Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, I guess we're going to meet out here this time. So if you're interested in being involved in a group, I uh, encourage you to do that. Also, next Sunday, uh, potluck. <laughs> so churches do, right? So... Uh, we uh, look forward to being able to be together to continue conversations even more so than we typically do uh, when we gather here during break time and afterwards. So uh, plan next week. We'd love to have you join us for uh, lunch right after the service. Anything else that I need to tell people about? Okay, we also give you a chance uh, to tell a little piece of your story, uh, something that God has been teaching you, something he's done in your life. It doesn't have to be, and I did what God said and lived happily ever after. It doesn't have to be that kind of a story. <laughs> it can have any kind of current reality, but it's just something that, that pictures for, that we share with each other, and we can picture for each other what it looks like to be following Jesus in the midst of the troubles that Jesus said we will experience in this world. So does anyone have a story that they are willing to share. Your mouth is open, but I don't see your hand up. Okay. Jeannie has one that she'll share at the end after we go off of our live feed. Well, you mean at the end of the service? Yeah. I'm with the kids today. Oh, you're with the kids. Go you're going to have to ask her during break time what her story is. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So I'm looking kind of at the camera this morning. This message is for whoever's out there um, and for everybody in here, but uh, I thought I should, would share. So uh, we do a Thursday morning men's group, and in God's word it says, do not forsake the assembly. Right? So we're all here today, and the assembly is uh, you know, to worship God and to be with the heavenly hosts that love him. As God's word says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Thursday morning, I walked in uh, to men's group, and I guess it was early, uh, but maybe the cares of the world or the thoughts of the world were on my mind. Not necessarily do I have troubles or anything, but my countenance was uh, clearly a little bit low. And uh, my brother, Mike Tromley, looks at me as I'm coming through the door, and, and he he rebukes me. He says, you know, your countenance uh, isn't good today, brother. And so maybe that's a prayer request, uh, that, you know, my countenance be as God would have it to be, right? To be filled with joy and to be a light, right? In all situations, because we, we have troubles or whatever in life, but at the end of the day, we're saved by grace. And yeah, there's, we are not in trouble or, neither, or I am I'm not in trouble. But I guess the point being, um, it is good to have brothers and sisters in Christ that love on us and that are willing to share. And for anybody that's out there that isn't here today, don't forsake the assembly of God. You, you can sit at home and you can watch sermons, um, and they're good, don't get me wrong. Uh, but that message is not applied applicably always to you unless you are with the body of Christ. So make sure that you are assembling and that you are loving on one another. Anybody else? So uh, take a break, look around, introduce yourself to someone you don't know or Say hi to someone you haven't had a chance to greet yet. We'll gather back in about three minutes.
Okay, time to get back to your seats. Invite you to continue your conversations at the end of our service, which I've observed that you have no hesitation in doing. So that's a good thing. So our series uh, continues in the book of Revelation, but we're actually starting a new series called Things to Come, the Future. Uh, it's Revelation 4 to 22. Uh, there's something in the passage today that will give us a clue as to why we break it there and why this becomes a new series. I read to you chapter 4, which is the passage for this morning's message, and there might have been some questions that that passage brought to mind when you heard it, because there's amazing images throughout the book of Revelation, including and starting with chapter 4. This kind of literature is called apocalyptic literature, and it uses uh, symbols and imagery to communicate um, powerful messages, often about, un, I would say, unseen reality would be a good way of saying it. So I've entitled uh, today's message, uh, a door of hope to unseen reality. And just taking it directly from the text, because in the text, John is there on the Isle of Patmos. He's been imprisoned there by the government, by the Roman emperor. And he says, because of the word, uh, basically it's because he's a Christian, because he's a significant person in the Jesus movement, he has been like put off on this prison island. And so you could say in many ways, if he was just looking at the circumstances of his life, he would maybe say, what, what good is it? What have I done? What's the point? Because here I follow Jesus from the time he called me as a disciple. And I went through the time of uh, being trained by him and then the terrible experience of the crucifixion where we lost hope and then the amazing amazing reignition of hope that came through the resurrection and then the beginning of the Jesus movement the day of Pentecost all that happened uh, tradition would suggest that he was a pastor of the church of Ephesus for many years and Ephesus if you remember was the first of the seven churches of the books of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 so John could have been discouraged, disheartened. In this vision that we see in Revelation chapter 4, God opens the door or invites him through a door where he shows him some things that are true, but that just walking around in his daily life on the Isle of Patmos, he would not have seen. I believe one of the reasons God gives us this vision through John is because we can have that same experience. We can look at our lives, the troubles, the circumstances, the hardships that are right in front of us, and it can give us a story or we can make up a story about ourselves and about reality that aren't true, but they feel true. So uh, be thinking of what some of those messages might be that you're dealing with as we look through this vision. Things are not as they seem. This is a powerful conviction of apocalyptic literature like this. And so basically it's like, let me tell you or show you some reality. It's there. You just don't see it. And that's what God is doing to John, through John, to us. So, uh, as we journey through our lives, uh, we all view life, you could say reality, or we have a version of reality that we believe to be true. 
The question is whether our version of reality is actually in alignment with what is true or with reality. The prayer request of the young gal with an eating disorder is an example of that. It's a, a prime example of living with one version of what I perceive reality to be and then making choices aligned with that, which in actuality are doing great damage to my health versus embracing the reality of what truly is, which is a different story than that. And until that story gets corrected, the behaviors will align with the perception of what reality is. Now we all do it, not necessarily to the depths, if you could say, of literally starving ourselves because we have a picture of ourselves, our body image or whatever, that is different than reality. And the mirror isn't enough to override that story that we're telling ourselves. So it is, with that background, I think it's important for us to, to say, what does it look like for me to be continually open to and inviting of God's story of reality or picture of reality to be the one that I increasingly embrace and align with and adjust my story whenever I see that it is an error? Often, um, and I believe one of the key things that Satan does to attack us, um, the scriptures talk about schemes that he has. So this would be strategies or ways to take uh, followers of Jesus down and those who might be uh, open to hearing the good news of Jesus and responding to it. The, one of the things he does is uh, tells us stories that are not true. And if you remember the story of the beginning of sin in the Garden of Eden, there's a perfect environment. God has created a world ideally suited to the, the human beings, Adam and Eve, that he has created to enjoy him, community with him, and the world he has created for them. Then in that context, you could say on a day like any other day, the evil one, uh, taking the form of the serpent, comes to Eve, and basically the thing that he does is um, invites her to make up a different story about God in her mind than the one that is true or that is reality. So basically the story is, you think God is good and everything he made for you is good, and whatever he tells you about life and how to live is good. What if that's not true? What if God doesn't even really care about you? And the only reason he gives you rules or restrictions or things that he says aren't good for you to do is just because it doesn't work for him. And so basically the tree of the knowledge of good and evil becomes then not something to avoid because it's good for me not to do that because God knows what's best for me. It becomes something he's holding out on them by now if they can eat that then they'll be equal to me and I wouldn't like that because then we all be the same and I want to be the best and so Eve is invited to make up a new story about God and about life and about reality and what she should be paying attention to and she makes up the new story that if I'm really going to be concerned about me and us and my family then I need to do what's best for me and as he describes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that seems like a pretty good thing. If we knew everything there was to know about good and bad, we'd avoid the bad and do the good, and life would be good, and we could take care of ourselves. We could literally be God to ourselves. We don't need God. So that's what they do. The curse results, and it doesn't only affect human beings, Immediately, they realize they're naked and they run to hide. They start blaming each other for the problems that come up in life. They don't want to be with God. Community with God, enjoyment of his presence, all of a sudden becomes this avoidance thing rather than this enjoyable, pleasant part of their daily routines. What's really cool is it can sound like, man, God still got messed up in a hurry. Like, 
you're three chapters in and all of a sudden the whole thing is gone. You know, it's not what it was intended to be. Yet even in chapter three of Genesis, you have this prophecy that somehow God already had in his mind. He knew the possibility. And I would even say uh, he knew all of the possibilities and he knew that it would be that they would choose one of the possibilities, which wasn't good, which is to sin, but that he also had in his larger story plan a way to deal with that. But it would involve pain. It would involve facing the sword that the, the son of God, the descendant of Eve, the descendant of Abraham, the descendant of Jacob, descendant of David, as prophecy talks about in many, many ways and places, is going to come and deal with this problem so that the thing that Satan has, the hold that he has over sinners, which all of us were born into sin, will and can be released because someone takes our place and takes the sword, you could say. You remember in the Garden of Eden, the sword is protecting all the goodness that God created from sinful human beings going there. And you could say living forever in their sin, which wouldn't be a good and positive thing. If you read the chapters immediately following the fall, uh, by chapter six, you have everyone was continually doing evil all the time, except for Noah. And so God, you know, takes a remnant out. So anyhow, the story... Uh, is not good. So uh, if you're John, if you're followers of Jesus in the days of the 90s, not 1990s, zero, zero 90s, um, you could make up a story that following Jesus in the Jesus movement is not the way to go or that it's not, God isn't, his plan isn't working very well because um, starting in the 60s, Nero had started persecuting the church. Paul and Peter are both martyred in the 60s. Um, he starts blaming the Christians for things that go wrong, including the fire of, of the city of Rome, which destroyed a good portion of the city of Rome, and he blames the Christians, and so they are punished, and many of them died. In the 90s, the emperor Domitian starts another or continues or intensifies the wave of persecution of Christians. Uh, tradition suggests that Timothy was martyred in the 90s under the, the persecution of Domitian. John, who uh, the tradition suggests that John comes in and replaces Timothy at Ephesus as the chief pastor, and now he's been exiled to Patmos. Is this thing going to fall apart? Is it die? Is the hundreds going to be like, okay, that was just a, you know, a 60 year deal uh, from 33 to, you know, 100. And now we're, we're going on to the next new religion. Or is following Jesus the core and essence of what we were made for and the path to life and the source of all reality that we should align ourselves with? So the book of Revelation gives us the story. So um, we're just going to go through the, the passage here. Um, uh, beginning in uh, Revelation 4, um, we, we read that, uh, let's see how it starts here. Um, I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven and the first vo voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, this is directly from chapter 1 verses 10, when Jesus is revealed and described, starting with chapter uh, 1, verse 10. And that same voice, so he's connecting the parts of Revelation together, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Um, this is something I found on the internet. It says, uh, uh, prophetic art of James Nesbitt. I think he's a Jewish Christian. And you can get his art that like stuff... Uh, I think it's johnnesbitt.com or something. So I want to give him full credit. There was no way to like get the images to use on this other than just you know cut and paste, which is what I did. But because this, this 
I, I looked at some people that tried to like do an artistic rendition of this scene, and I looked at it and I go, uh, that doesn't seem like, <laughs> that's not the picture I had in my mind. So I, I like this one because it, it gives that kind of mysterious, like there's something up there and there's like light and stuff, but it doesn't actually try to picture it in all the details. So uh, I've, I have a couple other images I'll use, but this one is a recurring theme that, that we'll use here. Um, and so in this setting that John finds himself where things are not going that well, and particularly in his specific situation, not going well at all, he gets given this vision, and he's, he gives a vision of Christ, chapter 1, and then of the, the, the letters to the churches, 2 and 3, and now starting chapter 4, um, we have, come up here, I'm going to show you something. And specifically, he says, what must take place after this? And uh, the, the outline for the book of Revelation, I think in, we can say, could come from, and he's quoting here from verse 19 of chapter 1, and this is how it goes. John, here's your job. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, the vision of chapter 1, the things that are, the letters to the seven churches, chapters 2 and 3, and then he says, and those that are to take place after this, which he picks up again in Revelation 4, chapter 1. So I think we could say from 4.1 to the end of the book are the things that are going to happen after this. Thus the title of the series, Things to Come. So, you cannot believe how much differences of opinion on how to interpret Revelation there are. I am not going to try to give you all of that. Here's what I, I intend to do. To take what I would be a normal understanding of a text, what does it seem most likely to be saying and to mean, and unless there's obvious markers in the text that would suggest that it should be un understood in a way like that the symbols mean something other than what they say, we're just going to take it for what it means. And if that's the case, there's nothing in the history of the church from the time of John till now that parallels with this, which suggests it's still to come. These are not descriptors of things that happened between 96 AD and now. These are descriptors of things that are still to come. And Jesus wants John to know them and to pass them on to us for the purpose, I believe, of our encouragement and our kind of embracing the fact there is a story going on here that we can be a part of, that God is doing. And let's like do it. Let's join and do our part in his larger story, looking forward to the consummation of the whole story which uh, the bad stuff is basically chapter 6 through 19, which describes the tribulation period. Starting uh, after that, 20, 21, 22, it's um, uh, the future millennial kingdom, the, uh, the coming uh, new heaven and new earth and eternal state. So it's like he's wrapping up the whole story of the Bible in the book of Revelation. So he then says... Uh, he goes up to, to open, goes through the open door, and this is like a vision um, of heaven. And heaven isn't like literally, you could say, a place. It's almost more like what we would consider if you follow any science fiction or anything like that. And they're talking about other dimensions where it's like there's a reality going on that you don't see. So we're not talking about amazing amounts of distance, but we're talking about uh, we can't see it right now. But John is enabled to see it, and here's what he sees. He said, Behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. So, I was reading through this passage this week. Twelve times it mentions there's a throne. So if you just want to say, I wonder what the important thing for us to note in this passage is, the fact that you have throne, 
And it's, there's a couple of times that 20, this does not include the 24 thrones of the elders. This is just the throne that God is on. 12 times in 11 verses. So one big takeaway is God is still on the throne. Even if we don't see it, even if it doesn't seem like he is, even if the world and the chaotic situation of our life or the world situation we see appears to be there's no one in charge, or if there is, it's a bad person. That is not reality. Reality is God is on his throne. John is enabled to see it, and he tells us so that we can embrace that reality. Um, I think we can assume from that that his larger story is if he's on the throne, then what he's doing is what he wants to do, and what he isn't doing is what isn't ready to happen yet. And we can trust him on that, on the time. So then it says uh, he, he had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. So some of these images, it's like, what do we do with that? <laughs> I don't even know what Jasper is or Carnelian. Um, Jasper is probably more like a diamond, and Carnelian would be like a ruby. So you have this uh, iridescent kind of, you know how diamonds are just like sparkly and all that. Interestingly also, uh, the priest, the high priest had a, like a breastplate with 12 stones representing 12 tribes of Israel. Number one is Jasper. Number 12, Carnelian. So you could have even here this symbolic picture of uh, the one that the, the God's chosen people, the Israelites, this is a, the God of, you know, that. So, but he doesn't explain the detail there. Um, but just the, he's giving us this, I, I would just say color is a strong impression that he gets. The question then is, is this Jesus on the throne or is it the representation of God the Father? I personally I lean towards it being a representation of God the Father because in the next chapter we have a description of Jesus on the throne who's described as the, both a lion and a lamb. And so I think he's picturing here the, the aura of God the Father in control on his throne um, doing the God stuff that needs to be done and we can have comfort in that as we go through our lives. Um, so whatever is going on, God is on the throne. Next, he says, and around the throne was a rainbow. It kind of looked like an emerald. Now, emeralds are green, so I'm not sure what, the, you know, how you get the, uh, the colors of the rainbow and that it looks like an emerald. But what, when you hear rainbow, what comes to your mind? Noah, the promise. And what's the promise? I'm never going to destroy all the humans except the ones that I save out again with water. It's In my mind, it's like this God who's on his throne and running the show and in control that we can depend on and, and journey through the difficulties of our lives because we know that's real, that's true, we don't have to look at our circumstances and go, I wonder what I did wrong. I wonder why God is picking on me right now. We can just go, he's on his throne. And when John looked at it, he sees this rainbow. And if you've ever seen a circular rainbow, I've heard that like sometimes pilots looking down, they look down the rainbow and it's like a circle. So I'm getting the idea, it's kind of like the rainbow is all around the throne, reminding of God's faithfulness, his grace, his desire to rescue and save, and that he can be completely and totally trusted because when he said he was never going to do this again, he never did it again. So I think it's a picture of safety, that God is uh, a safe and secure one to come to with whatever we're facing. Then he says, uh, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. I believe this is picturing the people of God throughout the ages. 
12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. Later on in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the New Jerusalem, there's symbolic things in the foundation for, I can't remember which is which, but the apostles and the tribes of Israel, both visually pictured in the story later on in the book of Revelation of the New Jerusalem. And so I think it's very likely that this also wants us to say, uh, with God in his, on his throne are all of his people of all ages. Old Testament believers, New Testament believers are there with God, anticipating and looking forward to the culmination, the fulfillment, and the, the carrying out of the things to come, the rest of his story, and all of that. And they're, they're not wringing their hands wondering what's going to happen next. Or is God, does he know what he's doing? They're just like, as you'll see, they are not doing that. Um, then it says, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. This is not just visual for John. <laughs> There's sound effects, too. So he goes up there, he's seeing all this stuff, and he's hearing that, which... I mean, I don't know about you, but there's something about like a storm with lightning and thunder and all that. I mean, if you get the, the, the thing on your phone that says tornadoes could be in the vicinity, you dive down to the lowest place in your house. There's something about it that's just kind of an awesome and like, yeah, no, no human being can come up with a way to keep that from happening. You know, it's like, let's turn the switch and make the storm go away. Yeah, good luck with that. You know, we cannot control the weather. We cannot control a storm. If you're near the ocean in a storm, it's like, whoa. You see all the waves crashing and just the power and the awesomeness of it. He's getting a sense of that that's associated with God and his presence and the fact that he's going to do what he's going to do. So, um, interestingly, too, as we go through the book of Revelation, um, and, and one of the things to note is, uh, we'll look at this next week, but this is the scene within which the scroll with the seals is presented, and John starts crying, what we'll see next week, because there's no one that can open the scroll which tells the story about what's going to happen next until he gets told, Jesus can open. So anyhow, next week we'll, we're going to look into that. But we're being presented here with the scene in the, you could say, the court of God who's in control of everything. And as the scene gets presented with the idea of, and what about what's going to still happen? It's presented in this figurative way that there's this scroll, or you could, for us it would be a book, but as the book gets presented, no one can open it up and figure out what's in there. And so John's upset by that. So this is the scene where all this kind of background and setting is given to us so that the rest of the book, instead of just looking at it like, okay, here's the outline of the Bible prophecy and what's going to happen in the future, and it's kind of this academic exercise, this is a very awesome relational experience for John that will then include you know, the opening of the seals and you start reading the in step six and following and all this stuff that happens. And it's like, whoa, that doesn't sound very pleasant. And it isn't. But we'll understand the reason for that when we get to those passages. So then he says, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Remember what I said, that we will take things for what they mean and just the most common sense of understanding it, unless there's some reason why we would do something different. There's several indications in the book of Revelation that would suggest that the seven spirits of God is just a way of describing the Holy Spirit, not seven different spirits. So some of the numbers in Revelation can mean something different than the literalist might say, okay, where's the other six spirits? If, if one of them is the Holy Spirit, but it's just a comprehensive way 
And the number seven is a number of perfection. So it would be a way of saying the Holy Spirit is perfect and complete in every way, providing all that is needed uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so I believe the torches are a visual representation of the comprehensive and completely uh, enough ministry of the Holy Spirit during the time between uh, the first coming of Christ and the culmination of all the events that the book of Revelation talks about. Uh, he then says, before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Remember what I said about the storms and the water and the awesomeness? In most cultures, including the culture of the Roman Empire at the time of the writing of this book, the sea is viewed as a place of danger, of chaos, of surprising disruption. And so you have things like shipwrecks were, were common. Uh, some of the stories in the book of Acts, when Paul's going somewhere, it's like, well, he's got to stay there because if they try to get out on a ship between this month and this month, likelihood is they're going to have a shipwreck, they're going to be lost, and everything's going to be destroyed. So the sea is this area of chaotic disruption and unpleasantness for human beings. What's the sea like around the throne? Have you ever been at the lake or the ocean when there's no wind? I mean, if you're in the ocean, there's still kind of a little bit of like lapping waves, but it can be, literally, you can be out in a boat and it's, it's almost like a mirror. It's so calm. That's what this is like. And I believe he's symbolically picturing that God on his throne is able to, to take even the, that disruptive thing that he just heard the lightning and thunder and the storm and imagine yourself being at sea, but with God, that can be like glass. That's what I think he's picturing here. Interestingly, and this is one of the reasons I believe this, new heaven and new earth, no sea. So when there is a sea, God is able to keep it calm if it's in his plan to do so. And when we are uh, able to experience his new creation, when everything is made the way we long for it to be, we were literally created for it to be and have been redeemed to be able to enjoy it with him forever, there's not going to be any sea. So back to the elders in a bit. First, some of the most confusing parts. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. This is the same artist here, uh, Nesbitt. He doesn't try to create the eyes because doing the eyes and the wings and the heads and all that, it's like you get some like, so we don't really know what that looked like, but I like the way he he, he emphasized the four heads and also the six wings are another artistic thing that he that he did. So uh, the first living creature was like a lion and the second one was like an ox and the third one was like a man and the fourth one was like an eagle. And he starts, um, uh, starts with lion, ox, man, eagle is how he does it. So what is this about? So think about it this way. Uh, the ox is like the epitome of a domestic animal that is useful, think before tractors, <laughs> for farming, for, you know, grinding things, you know, the wheels that would go around and around to, to thresh the grain, different things. So the ox is the epitome of a domesticated animal. The lion is the epitome or the awesome, most powerful of the wild creatures that can't be domesticated or used in any good way. The eagle is the most powerful, the most dominant within the bird uh, empire or within all the birds. And humans are, every animal, even if it doesn't have a natural enemy within nature, they fear man. 
because we can figure ways to like do bad to them. So uh, there are many who believe this is maybe these are like because uh, they're similar in many ways to cherubim and cherubim and seraphim as they're described in scriptures. But then they have these these visual things that seem to represent all of God's creation. So and and we know from the scriptures that the curse affected God's creation. So we're saying here as John is in the throne room of, of the Father and experiencing like God in control, within that context, you have representation of all of his creation who are subjected to him and worshiping him. And it says various places in scripture, like if people don't praise God, even the stones will like bring praise to God. So you do have this very strong idea that creation is was created oriented to God. It's not just this neutral, unaffected thing. It's actually part of what God did, and the curse affected it. So it's not now functioning as it one day will. And you even get these pictures of uh, nature's enemies hanging out together, enjoying each other, not eating each other up <laughs> in the new creation. And so you kind of, my picture is that like he's picturing that within the context of this scene in God's throne room, you will have this idea of all of God's creation worshiping the Father and being uh, in tune with what he's doing and with his story. And so then you uh, hear that the four living creatures, day and night, here's what they're doing. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping God day and night. Um, what we can learn from this, I believe, is that when we worship, that if we embrace reality, we are joining worship that is already going on and that is anticipated. So we just join in this, you could say this unseen reality is there's worship going on in the throne room of heaven with God the Father now. And when we worship, we're just joining what's already going on. Which we get that picture then. He comes back then to those 24 thrones and the elders sitting on the thrones with the crowns and the white garments. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, which I believe represents God's people of all ages. And if just some of the reasons for that, there's things in Revelation talk about white garments are represent the righteous deeds of the saints and crowns are rewards that the righteous deeds of the saints get rewarded for. So you get this picture of, you could say, rewarded saints, God's chosen who have gone on before us, represented there, or you could say the representation of all those people are there with the, the their honoring or reward. Some people believe it's a picture that the church will not go through the period starting in chapter 6 through 19, which describes the tribulation period, and that this is intended to give a picture that they are with the Father in heaven apart from the world during this time. I don't think you can prove that, but it, it certainly would be consistent with that kind of a, a view that he might be wanting to picture. And uh, the church is never mentioned from the chapter 3 to the end in like chapter 21 or 22, the church is mentioned again. So it's not mentioned at all in chapter 16 through 19. So what are they doing? They fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. And you've probably heard this imagery before, like when we can get rewarded, we're just going to throw our crowns at Jesus' feet. And that's coming from this passage here. Um, and here's what they say. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed, and they were created. 
This scene reminds us that the great end of life is knowing, loving, serving, and enjoying our God and King. If you lived in the culture of the time that this was written, the Caesar of Rome was the one that they were giving praise and honor and glory and all that too. So that if Caesar would come into your town, one of the things you would say is worthy is Caesar to receive glory and honor and all that. When the Caesar went into the Senate, where the government uh, before like Caesar became, as the Roman Empire progressed, the Caesar became more and more dominant and more like a dictator. But initially there was a Senate and they worked together uh, in, in government. But when the Caesar would walk into the Senate, the senators would all say, worthy are you, O Caesar, to receive glory and honor. So this would be a concept that they would understand that the one who is most powerful, most in control, most worthy, you could say, of, of receiving worship, you should say that. You should, you know, make, make, make it obvious through your verbal and physical worship that you believe this is true. This is reality. For you, were, you created all things, he's the creator, and by your will they existed and were created, which would include like the symbolic four living creatures symbolizing uh, all of creation being subjected to God. So, reality is God is on his throne. He's in control. He has a plan. It's getting carried out, which next week we'll look into that in more detail as they present in this scene that we've just now been given is going to enter then this idea of this scroll and the, who, can, who can read the scroll, who can interpret it, who can tell us uh, what's going to happen next. Um, the Philippians chapter 2 has a similar idea to this when uh, the Apostle Paul right to the church at Philippi says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if I was going to, which I typically do, uh, think in terms of what exactly is the essence of this message? What is he trying to get across? If you could just boil it down, it's like the maple syrup. You know, you start with 40 gallons and end with one, I think. I can't remember what the ratio is, but you start with a lot to just get down to the stuff you pour on your pancakes. So this is the way I would describe it. The door Jesus invites John to enter pictures for us unseen heavenly reality that can correct our perception of reality and stimulate within us hope and worship regardless of what is happening now. So in the picture of whatever you thought of when we first started the message about what's happening now and the things that can go on that we can say, why is this happening? Why do bad things happen? Jeannie's driving down the road the other day, I-75. Some truck or something throws a big stone, hits the windshield, cracks it, you know. So we call up the insurance adjuster. You know, normally they can come out and they'll do it free, like you don't have to pay the deductible. They say, well, is it bigger than a dollar bill? Let me check. <laughs> well, yes, in fact, it is bigger than a dollar bill. Well, then you have to pay $100. So, first of all, we're just going about our business, you know. <laughs> and now we got to pay the hundred dollars. We can't find whoever it was that threw the stone up, and like you know, it's like okay, we got to pay a hundred dollars just because there's stones on the road and they get thrown up on your windshield. So the guy comes out and replaces, and they like, hey, man, that's cool. That worked out. That was convenient. So we go down the road to, later on that day after we're allowed to drive, you know, like wait a half an hour and whatever, and so it rained. The, we have this feature on our car where it's like it senses whether the wipers need to go. I don't know, some of you with more modern vehicles, it's a, it's a late 
model kind of thing. My, my car does not have it on it, but Jeannie's does. It's not working. So it could be they put the wrong windshield on and they forgot to ask us, did it have a rain sensor? And because they forgot to ask us, now we got to have them come back on Tuesday and maybe put on a new one or, you know, who knows what happened. But it's like stuff like that happens. That's just a little thing. I mean, it's not like a relational thing. It's not like, but it's inconvenient. It's challenging. We're working on a renovation project at our house. And I know a little bit <laughs> and I do some stuff, but some stuff happens it's like, okay, what do you do when this happens? Or how do you fix that? Or how do you avoid that? And I think I've mentioned to you, our roof has been leaking for some time and I get it fixed and it might go for a year or two and then it starts leaking again. And I go up there and try to figure out, so I'm up there again yesterday. About two weeks ago, I went up there. I thought I had it fixed. It rained several times, didn't leak. It snowed and then when the snow melted, it started leaking. Didn't leak when it rained, leaks when the snow's on and it's melting. I'm thinking, what's the explanation of that? <laughs> Where would the leak be that only leaks when snow is melting, but not when rain is falling? So I go up and try to use all my creative abilities to figure out where could this possibly be, you know. And every time I go up there, I have this sense of hope that I think I found it. Because <laughs> I usually put something somewhere that could be maybe the problem. See, that's what it's like to live in a fallen world because there's, and you guys probably have much worse <laughs> than those two things. But those are just two things this week that are like that. And sometimes what we can do when those stories come, is like, well, I must be doing something wrong. Because if God is good and he loves me, then when I go up and put a new roof on, it's not going to leak. <laughs> or, or if when I drive down the road in my car, the stones are going to fly over me or beside me and not onto the windshield and break it where I have to pay $100 and then call the guy back again. We can take away from this. God is on the throne. He's doing what he said he's going to do. He can get us through whatever stuff like that is happening during this time when the fallen world stuff is going on. And we can have great hope and anticipation and amazing connection with God and worship even when stuff isn't going great in our lives. Lord, thank you so much for John, for Revelation, and for this passage that we looked at today, and also for the ones that we'll look at in the future. I pray that they encourage our hearts to stay firmly rooted in the belief, your reality as being the core and essence of reality that we want to align our lives with as we journey through even the hard times of life. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. See you next week. Chapter 5.